So I just finished filming the Q&A and eating snacks video and the first couple minutes of the video is not there. So I just have to redo this intro and say what I said at the beginning of the video. Hi guys, it's Pumpkino. It's Halloween. <laughs> This is green curry flavor ramen and it says that it's super hot but you never know like sometimes they say it's super hot and it's not at all and then other times you're dying. I have soy milk on standby in case, just in case. Ooh, <laughs> there is, is this a sticker? There is a Luigi Mansion sticker inside. I guess this came out recently. I'm not I'm not up to date with what Luigi's doing. It doesn't smell spicy. It kind of smells like vegetable thins. I don't know if that's like a Canadian thing. It smells like vegetable crackers. I have my hot water here. I should have kept the lid on. You're supposed to like keep the heat in. I don't know how long I'm gonna keep this on by the way because I might get sweaty. So this is gonna take about three minutes. I'm probably gonna wait longer because my tongue is very sensitive and this looks very hot. So I'm gonna answer the first question which was probably what I got asked most and that was how did I get into tarot and there's also how did I get into astrology. There are a couple of different occasions where I have talked about this but I'm trying to think if I can add something that I haven't talked about before. I got into astrology in my mid to late teens. At first I just had a pretty surface level knowledge. Basically I knew my sun sign and I knew some of the traits of it like many of us do and I don't even remember how this happened but I learned about moon signs and when I found out that I was a Gemini moon it made a lot of sense for me. I really resonated with that and I think it was shortly after that that I started to learn about the other placements. Another reason that I got into astrology is because around that time I noticed that everybody in my life that I was having problems with was either a Virgo or a Scorpio and at that time I was a bit less evolved which I think is why I was butting heads with these people and I also didn't have that much knowledge of astrology just yet so I think I chalked it up to like oh you know those are the signs that Aries is supposed to be incompatible with so it makes sense but now that I'm older and I have a bit more knowledge, I realized that Scorpio suns would have their sun on my descendant. So that is a part of me that exists within me, but that maybe I'm disowning. It's my shadow side, the part that I don't want to admit is there. So if they're shining light on that, it's going to trigger me. And then Virgo is where my Chiron is. So if somebody's sun is on my Chiron and I am still unevolved, they're going to be illuminating parts of me that are unhealed. And I'm not going to like that either. Do I look like a dumbass like explaining all of this with a pumpkin head? I don't know. It's Halloween. Tis the season. It is kind of hot though. Let me see if these babies are ready. Oh, it still looks really hot though. Some good old classic... Chad Kroger hair or Justin Timberlake hair, whichever you prefer. Oh, okay. There's that fragrant curry smell. I don't think this is going to be too spicy. I don't think Luigi would do me like that. Mmm. <sighs> She's like fake spicy, you know what I mean? Like, you get that punch in your mouth, but she doesn't have any substance. By the way, let me know if you understand this phenomenon. There are certain noodles that I find way too spicy to eat, but my partner can eat them no problem. And then there's other noodles that I can eat no problem, but he finds way too spicy to eat. So is there like different kinds of spicy and like certain people are sensitive to certain kinds of spicy? Because that doesn't make sense to me. Mm, I can see how the heat would build up, you know, if you ate the whole thing. I really like the soup, actually. I can't slurp noodles, by the way. You know, like Japanese people slurp the noodles. I can't do it. So I just kind of chomp them. Mm. The pumpkin is... 
pumpkin sweaty girl. So that's how I got into astrology and then somehow I started to learn about Vedic astrology. I actually find that both resonate and at first I didn't think that I would be able to resonate with both because I was like, you know, if I'm a Aries sun in Western and a Pisces sun in Vedic astrology, like how does that make sense? But the way an Aries is described in Western astrology and the way it's described in Vedic astrology is not exactly the same. And the way they describe certain planets in certain houses is not exactly the same. Off the top of my head, for example, in Western astrology, the North Node is seen as like your life purpose, like this thing that you're striving for. Whereas in Vedic astrology, it's actually a malefic placement and it can represent like greed and obsession and materialism and things like that. Whereas the South Node actually represents like detachment and spirituality and enlightenment. So I feel like that's kind of opposite in Western astrology, maybe. I actually find Vedic astrology to just be very, very complicated. I would love to learn more about it, but I get quite overwhelmed. Anyway, the reason I bring that up is because how I got into tarot is that I was watching some videos on Vedic astrology and then the algorithm recommended me a tarot video which was like a monthly prediction, like Aries for whatever month it happened to be. And just the first tarot video I ever watched resonated so much that it completely changed my mind about tarot because I didn't believe in it at first. I thought it's like, you're just pulling a random card. That doesn't make any sense. Why would there be anything to it? To think that I went from that to now wearing a pumpkin on my tarot channel. That's really crazy. And I mentioned this, I was on a podcast recently, the That's Deep podcast. Shout out Naomi. I was talking about like how if I just sit here and think about it for long enough, it's I kind of become in disbelief, you know? I think I take it for a given that this is my job and like this is what I do every day. When you are going through the motions of it every day, you can start to take it for granted. So I try to just remind myself frequently because it's, it's freaking crazy, like, it's all thanks to you. I guess I'm the type of person when I'm interested in something, I want to do it myself rather than just be like a consumer of it. So I, shortly after that, I bought my first tarot deck. Yeah, so that's how I got into it. There was also a question if I ever read for myself. And I used to read for myself a lot, okay? In my earlier years when I got into tarot, I would say I went through a period where I was, my mental health was not very good and I would read for myself way too much, not just with tarot, but I would use a pendulum, I would use this thing, which works kind of like a Ouija board, I don't use it anymore, I don't feel called to use it anymore, I don't really believe that there's an evil spirit in this thing, but I was just becoming dependent on it like for no reason, looking back I'm like, we really were obsessed with getting answers about certain things that did not matter. But it's part of the growth process. I feel like going through that, it's part of the growing pains of tapping into your intuition and figuring out what kind of relationship you want to have with divinity, divination. I was using it way too much to the point that I was just getting confused. I was just confusing myself. And then I was also watching other people's readings. So, at this point, I read for myself maybe like a few times a year if there's something I feel like I really want guidance on or I really want confirmation for. And I put my cards on my altar so that it feels more like a, a ritual and something a little bit more sacred than just a casual like, mm, let me pull a card. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I think I just don't want to like fall back into those old ways. So that is where I keep them. And I do get readings from other people. So I have a tarot reader and an astrologer that I go to. Astrologer once a year, the tarot reader maybe once or twice a year. Actually, I go to Charlotte. Recently on YouTube, I've been really liking 13 Moon Tarot. She has been my go-to. Speaking of readings, I also got a lot of questions about will I open personal readings again? Um, I can say pretty confidently that I would never do them regularly again. There was a point where I would open personal readings every single month, but 
They are very energy intensive, not just because of channeling the messages, but just the, you know, you're going back and forth with dozens of people all at once, you know, because you have several readings scheduled a day, um, several days a week. And so you have this back and forth of um, invoicing. I used to take the payments directly on the booking site, but then there would be a lot of people getting um, charged when they weren't supposed to be charged because too many people were accessing the site at the same time. So then I have to go back and forth with them via email. And then th you have to deal with the people who are upset at you because what do you mean? I accessed the site right at this time and I didn't get a booking. Can you squeeze me in? And it's just, um, it's a lot. It's a lot of energy to use. And then you have like the deadlines as well. So it's very energy intensive and don't get me wrong. I had the best time doing personal readings. I just opened them again in August and September, and it was such a lovely experience to get to know the few people who booked a reading. It's really such an honor to be able to connect with people around the world, and also just to see like the individuals who have been supporting me. I just know that if I were doing that every single month, I would burn out, and so it was a nice thing to do as like a special occasion um, but no I, I would not do them regularly again and if I do open them again it would probably be very spontaneous and just like limited number I actually also got a message suggesting that opening personal readings could help my friend in Gaza they're talking about Fares who we have been fundraising for I kind of remember this time like ah oh, yeah these are not <laughs> these are not the best way to raise money the reason being that personal reading is just for one person so it's, you know, I, I know maybe it's like bad for to be talking about money with this kind of spiritual stuff, but it's just for one person versus, you know, for example, a reading on Vimeo can be for many, many people. And even though the price is much less, of course, that does add up and it kind of has the potential to grow indefinitely. I did kind of have the idea of maybe doing like personal readings on a live stream. That might be a good way to fundraise. Um, I don't think that would be like burning out for me because it's like quicker readings and then you know we could get donations from the super chats i really wanted to do a giveaway i thought that that would be a wonderful idea like to do a giveaway for people who donated hi it's me from the future and i actually did end up making a giveaway it is open until november 1st um, but I might do more. I posted about it on Instagram and on the community section of my channel. So I will link both of those and you can view the details on whichever platform is best for you and see how you can enter. Thank you so much to everybody who was interested in a reading that the fact that you would trust me with something like that and to read your individual energy, you know, to connect to you and that kind of, it is kind of intimate, isn't it? To like know your story and I know who the energy is coming from. It's not like, oh, somebody out there in the sea of people that I'm reading for. So yeah, to trust me in that one-on-one -on -one way and just to know that there's people who after all this time, even though I haven't been doing personal readings um, as a regular part of my job for a long time, that there's still people who like would want a reading and who are asking about it. Like, I'm so grateful for that. But yeah, that is my answer about personal readings. Um, we will not, you know, never say never. I, I don't think I would ever do them regularly again. I might... Um, spontaneously open them sometimes. I actually have a mailing list uh, so that you can be notified if I ever do open them again. Um, I can't make any promises, but if you want to make sure that you're notified, um, you can sign up for that. And yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. Chef Luigi Kiss. I really like this. I actually didn't think I was gonna like it. Let me actually take this time to introduce. We have, this is a uh, chestnut. Chestnut roasting on an open fire. This is chestnut flavored choco pie. It's like a chocolate cake sandwich with chestnut cream. Chestnut is really popular in Japan during fall and winter. Also potato, a lot of this is potato flavor. This is my favorite chocolate ever, Black Thunder. Um, I like, there's all kinds of flavors. The plain one is really good. This is a purple potato flavored Black Thunder. I'm excited for that one. Spooky apple pie flavored Kit Kats. Apple flavored, these are called like fettuccine gummies because they're long and flat. 
much like fettuccine is. Then this is roasted sweet potato brulee panda shaped cookies. I really like these panda cookies. I haven't had this flavor or anything similar before. I feel like I've, I started to like sweet potato and chestnut in this kind of fall flavors more in my old age, post Saturn return, okay? And then I've never had this in any flavor before, picora. I've never even heard of this before. So either I'm living under a rock or she is uh, an indie brand. <laughs> Okay. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with this one. I would like to know for my Gemini moons, do you also like mix your food together? Like my dad and I are both Gemini moons and we we will not eat just like one cereal. We have to put like three different kinds of cereal. We're always just mixing things. This drink is like a mix of a bunch of teas and like vinegar. I, my dad does the same thing. So I wanna know, is it a Gemini moon thing? Oh. That was a good idea. Hmm. I wasn't expecting it to taste that much like a sweet potato. It tastes like a real potato. Okay. 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 Okay, I really wanted to answer this one. Types of healing and which is the best for anxiety? Whew. I really feel for anybody who is struggling with anxiety. I struggle with it for most of my life and I still occasionally do. It was probably the worst. Now it was pretty bad for most of my life. I would say just in the past couple of years, it started to get better. Um, of course, I can only answer this question from my experience. And I do want to mention that like it never got to a point where I had to be medicated or go to the hospital or anything like that but i would have physical symptoms like i would often faint and i know how awful the feeling is when you're having anxiety or like an anxiety attack a panic attack you just want to stop existing and it feels like nothing makes it better so i wanted to share what helped me just in case it could help somebody who is struggling with anxiety so i wanted to talk about things that you can do like in the moment and then also kind of preventative things that have helped me so in the moment when you're already starting to feel like oh shit, i'm having an anxiety attack this is a pretty common one like we often say to take deep breaths and breathe slowly but if that isn't working i would stop breathing into Entirely. This is something that I would intuitively do when I was a kid when I was having an anxiety attack I would just hold my breath. I would stop breathing and that made me feel better and I think it's because when you're Hyperventilating I didn't know but you can have not enough carbon dioxide in your body So if you stop breathing then it can build up a little bit um, But yeah, that helps and then also <laughs> Okay, I'm about to like act it out, but if you like tilt your pelvis forward so your lower back is kind of rounded and then like push it helps to calm you down and this is because of the vagus nerve i'm pretty sure a lot of the things to calm anxiety have to do with the vagus nerve cold temperatures are very helpful i am blessed to be from canada i mean not like i'm proud to be canadian but i'm blessed to be from a cold country so like in the winter or something, I would just go outside where it's like minus 20 degrees and Celsius and that really cold air would calm me down. When I was a little kid, I would lie down on the cold tile, like on my stomach and that would make me feel better. And something I started to do as a young adult, I would go into the bathroom 
and lie on the floor because I had like a cold tile floor in the bathroom and I would run the shower as cold as possible so you get the sound of the running water which is calming and then also because the water is so cold it makes the room cold and that's something that would help as well and then I would just keep telling myself over and over you don't have to do anything you don't have to do anything because I feel like a lot of my anxiety stemmed from like being overwhelmed from pressure of these things that I have to do and feeling like I can't do it all. So those are the things that help in the moment. It might be a different thing that you can repeat to yourself that calms you down, um, but for me it's like you don't have to do anything, you don't have to do anything. I would tell myself like we're gonna cancel everything because I think it's this feeling of when you're at the heights of your anxiety you're thinking like desperate times call for desperate measures. So I just have to tell myself like don't worry we're not gonna do anything. You don't have to do anything right now. And then usually the next day I'm fine and I can go do whatever I, I had to do. And then in terms of a more preventative way to decrease anxiety in my everyday life, what I really noticed is that it's, it's very much a holistic thing. It's not like one thing you do that cures anxiety. It's like the efforts that you make in all areas of your life. Um, I understand the irony in me saying this with a big tray of sweets in front of me, but I found that consuming sugar really made my anxiety worse. I don't eat sugar that much anymore, like I don't eat it during the week. That's one thing. Um, running for me really helps to relieve stress, that's probably not for everybody, but some form of exercise can be a helpful preventative measure and also just self-love because and I think this is the biggest thing for me because at the end of the day I was letting things make me anxious or I was letting myself stress over things because I didn't think my inner peace was important or I would I would let I would let people step over my boundaries and overwhelm me so my responsibility right I'm letting them do that because I don't think my boundaries are important so I'm creating these situations that make me anxious because I, there was like a part of me that felt that's how I deserve to feel. And when I thought about it, I felt like I got in trouble a lot as a kid. <laughs> so, uh, and that made me feel very anxious. And so when that happens, then I become hyper vigilant because I'm like, I don't want to get in trouble again. So I think I associated anxiety equals I'm not going to get in trouble because it's going to keep me in check. It's going to, the anxiety is going to keep me behaving how I'm supposed to. If I stop worrying, I'm going to start doing bad things again. I kind of associated inner peace with a slacking. I'm being careless. I'm slacking. I'm being irresponsible. So I better not let myself get too calm. That's kind of how I was thinking about it. So if you can maybe ask yourself like, what what do I think would happen if I let myself not worry about this thing? Or like, is, do I have some kind of negative association with being relaxed? Do I have some kind of positive association with being anxious, like subconsciously? You might. I've been talking to myself a lot recently. <laughs> I, think, I think I kind of replaced doing readings for myself with talking to myself because I have all the answers anyway. So, I was just like walk around my living room and talk to, I often talk to my teenage self, the parts of me that are insecure, the parts of me that I think are not good enough, just like from a very curious place of like, where do you think this came from? Oh, that's where that came from? And sometimes I'm very surprised, like you kind of forget the root of where your anxieties came from. And I, I realized recently that I had a wound. It sounds so dumb when I say it, but like, no, it's not dumb. Like teenage Carrie had a reason to feel that way, but I had a big wound around not having one thing that I'm good at. Like I wanted to have, I wanted to have one thing that I poured all my energy into and that defined me rather than having a bunch of different interests. And that was, that was giving me grief like until very recently, but I, I didn't realize that that's what it was. I'm like, oh my God, it's this unprocessed thing from being a teenager where I feel like I want to be good at one thing. And I don't even feel that way now, but it was still, that thought was still planted there and still giving me stress. It's like you feel the emotion from the thought without even remembering the root thought that caused it. I don't know. It's weird. Time is weird like that. Your, your brain is like a time capsule. 
Anyway, I think that was a bit of a tangent, but I hope that that was helpful. This video is gonna be a lot longer than I thought. Oh my god, okay. Let I'm gonna eat something before we get into this. Let me eat a... I just ate a potato one. Let me go for a chestnut. Okay, look at this. I love chocolate pies too. Ooh! Girl, that is good. I think it could be... It could be more chestnutty. Like, you definitely get the chestnut, but the chocolate's a bit overpowering. Here, I feel like it was too much potato. And here, I feel like it was... The, the chestnut wasn't really shining. But it's good, it's good. Okay, so the next question is, when did you hear about Twin Flames for the first time? What's your take on this theme? So actually, I heard about them for the first time from the tarot channel that was first recommended to me. So that's when I first started to learn about the concept. This would have been like 2018, 2019-ish. I don't really know what's going on in the Twin Flame discourse these days. I personally don't see that much of it anymore. And I don't know if that's just like my algorithm or if we kind of as a collective moved away from it because I do feel like there was kind of a Twin Flame frenzy when I started my YouTube channel, like around 2019 and 2020. Let me know if you feel the same way. Maybe that's just my um, perception. I do feel like at that time, love readings were very popular as well. And I don't know if it had something to do with like the Twin Flame thing being popular. I'm actually very curious what your experience is. Like, is the discourse still going strong? Is it not such a popular topic anymore? Let me know what your experience has been. I'm very much just speculating, but I think the reason that I and maybe many other readers don't talk about it so much is because it is a touchy topic for many people. Um, and a lot of the... A lot of the narrative around it that was pushed at that time was kind of promoting a toxic dynamic. And there's also a lot of gatekeeping and a lot of invalidating of each other's experiences. And I think that just kind of goes to people wanting to be special, right? So um, there will be people saying like, oh, they're very, very rare. There's only like a thousand twin flames in the world and I just happen to be one of them. And and if your experience is even just a little bit different than theirs, oh, you're not twin flames, that's your false twin. Like there's just, there was a lot of invalidation and a lot of gatekeeping going on. And I firmly believe that nobody can tell you like if you are a twin flame or who is your twin flame. And I wanna apologize if I've ever done that to somebody through like a general reading or through a personal reading. Um, I would also like to apologize if I ever enabled a toxic dynamic using the twin flame rhetoric. <laughs> I don't know if that's the good word for it, but only you can really know that answer because if you think about it, at the end of the day, your twin flame is you. And so nobody can tell you who is you. <laughs> like no, nobody can tell you who you are right? That's something that you have to feel for yourself. And I think that even if you did get a reading and someone else told you yes or no, it's not really going to hit. It only hits when the answer comes from you. And I also personally believe that every journey is different. So that doesn't really fit with the popular narrative either. There's all these kinds of like rules and signs that this person is your twin flame that I don't necessarily agree with. Like, I've seen, you know, it has to be a man and a woman in like a straight relationship and the man has to be the masculine and the woman has to be the feminine and there's a runner and a chaser and I've even seen like they have to have the same color of eyes or I've even seen somebody say that they have to be certain zodiac signs like all twin flames are a Leo and a Scorpio. I feel like people are just making shit up, you know? I also do think that it's just a very... <laughs> I think a lot of people who are in limerence get drawn to that kind of thing and that makes them vulnerable to psychic scams. Like, have y'all seen the 
the Netflix documentary. I used to watch their videos. That couple in the Netflix, I used to watch their videos. And I remember like, I used to like them and I remember the exact video that I was like, okay, <laughs> like this is, nope, like I was like, I am ahead of. Yeah, I still do very much believe in them. Um, I just, I think it's such a personal journey. I think it's such like, it's a journey with yourself, a journey with yourself to yourself. I don't know, would it, would it benefit twin flames on their journey like to have more guidance out there maybe or at least like something to combat a lot of the toxic stuff that is thrown around i don't know that's that's how i feel about it how can i know if i have psychic abilities how can i train them love ya thank you i love you too i am definitely one of those people who thinks that everybody has psychic abilities in some capacity um you know i mentioned the that's deep podcast uh earlier in this video and aso our lovely queen aso my best friend madison she was on on that podcast as well and she had an excellent analogy of it's like uh, singing you know there's some people who are born with an excellent singing voice there's some people who are born with not a very good voice but if they practice they can improve it and i think that psychic abilities are the same so some people could be born with very strong um extrasensory, extrasensory perceptions, very strong mediumship, um, and they don't really have to practice it. Like it just, it comes naturally to them. And then there's other people who maybe have to work that muscle a little bit more, but that doesn't mean that they can't develop psychic abilities. And I think it's something that we all do in our day-to-day -day lives, like our, our intuition, our sixth sense, if you will. It's something that we're kind of always using um, to some capacity, even if we don't realize it. So to the person who asked this question, I, I definitely think you do have psychic abilities and just like, and it's just like any other skill, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna mess up sometimes. Um, and I've talked about this before, but there's this kind of, I don't know if purist is the right word, but there's this idea of like, if you have a psychic ability, you'll be right every time and you'll know every everything but that's not the case the same way if you're an amazing singer you're not going to hit the perfect note every single time it's just like any other skill you're never going to be perfect at it but you can get better and so just like any other skill the way that you would train them is to practice <laughs> to practice doing it a lot i think we tend to get in our heads a lot about you know is this really me having a psychic experience or am i just pulling something out of my butt and I would go for when you're practicing, right? Assume that it's a psychic experience. Because I think a big thing that stops us from training our abilities is the fear of being wrong. Because it's something that's kind of debated if it even exists in this world. Um, everybody knows that singing exists. <laughs> everybody knows that singing can be done. So if you met someone who is tone deaf, and they're singing like, twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> You're not gonna be like, see, singing doesn't exist. Cause you've seen it, you've seen people sing really well. So you're just gonna be like, oh, singing exists. It's just that this one person is not, doesn't happen to be doing it right now. And so I think when we're in that mindset of really wanting to prove that psychic ability is even real, the failures, um, feel very invalidating and they feel very heavy like oh see this psychic stuff is just baloney so i think also really grounding that truth that psychicness is a thing i've seen it happen so even if i got something wrong that doesn't mean that psychic abilities don't exist it just means that i wasn't using them right now and that's okay it just means i made a mistake and that's okay i can learn from this mistake just like with any other skill that's something that's really helped me with manifestation as well Ooh, i get chills when i think about this but i i manifested something uh when was it? Maybe like three weeks ago, I manifested something. <laughs> I will never, just the way it happened was so weird. It was like, this is what I did. I pretended I was in a dream because when you're in a dream, things can randomly happen in any order and it doesn't matter how they happen. They just appear in front of you. So I pretended I was in a dream and every time my brain said, how is that going to happen though? How is that going to happen? I was like, it's not my, it's not my business. That's not my problem. It's just going to happen. And the weirdest thing 
like suddenly came out of nowhere and made it happen. So weird. I just, um, I pretended I was in a dream and I had like a picture in my mind of where I wanted to go in the dream. And, and I just went there like so weird. So after that moment, I will always believe that manifestation is real. So even in the future, if I fail to manifest something, never again will I have that thought of like, oh, I knew this manifestation stuff was BS. Like, no, I've seen it happen and I know I can do it. I, I know I'm a good runner. So just because I had a shitty run today, that doesn't mean anything. I know I'm a good singer. So just because I sound like shit on this song doesn't mean anything. I know I'm a good manifester. So sure, I didn't manifest this thing right now, but that doesn't mean I'm not good at it. That doesn't mean I don't have the ability. I just didn't do it. Happened to not do it in that moment. If you were a tarot card, what would you be? So I would have always answered this king of wands. I, I would have always answered this king of wands. Even, uh, I remember, you know, the hermit tarot. Um, I, I'm pretty sure this is accurate. I could be making it up, but I'm pretty sure the hermit tarot said the reason the channel is called the hermit tarot is because she pulled a card for what she should name her channel and the hermit card came out. So she was like, okay, hermit tarot. So I was like, hmm, I wonder what card would come out for me. And then it was the king of wands. So like, I do think that fits for me. Um, but now I'm feeling more like a queen of wands. I only just started to accept that I am a woman <laughs> and that I'm feminine like this year. Um, before that, I felt like not at all. So it's a nice feeling. And, and it was really just that I, um, I was externalizing like the permission to be feminine, you know? I'm, nobody gets to tell me how to be feminine. I am femininity. I exude it and you learn what it is. You don't tell me what it is. And then there was also, what's your favorite tarot card? I'm gonna be, <laughs> I'm gonna say something chaotic. I'm, I'm not like other girls. My favorite tarot card is the tower. But just right now, that's not, it's like my favorite tarot card is gonna change, right? I like temperance a lot too. Um, but yeah, I'm liking the tower recently because I feel like that's what I'm going through. And I feel like that's what the world is gonna go through soon. Institutions of power collapsing. I feel like a lot of old versions of me are losing power over me as well. What advice do you have to new tarot readers? So this kind of goes back to the building your psychic abilities, but don't be afraid to be wrong. That is part of the learning process. And the best way to learn is through doing. There are some good online resources for what tarot cards mean. One of them is Biddy Tarot. I used to use that quite a bit. And then there's another one, but I forget what it's called. I referenced this website quite a bit, Labyr Labyrinthos. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of it was just through doing. Same, same thing with astrology. I went through this phase when I was like 19, 20 of I would print out the birth charts of the people in my life, like family members, friends, stuff like that. And I would keep it in a clear folder <laughs> and just observe how they behave and like look at their chart and be like, oh, that's probably because of their blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and um, I would be that like drunk white girl being like, what's your birthday? What time were you born? <laughs> I had that kind of vibe. And yeah, it's like just observing how people behave and taking notes. And so same thing with tarot. Obviously I do a lot of freaking readings and I see um, what you guys are commenting and what that reading meant for you. Other advice I would give to new tarot readers is you don't have to use the textbook meaning. You don't have to, cause that's not, that's not really how tarot works. It can work that way, but tarot works with you. It's the tarot working with you. It's spirit working with you. If you learn the textbook meaning, spirit will make sure you see the right cards such that the textbook meaning is what that person needs to hear. If you make up your own completely random meaning to the cards, spirit will show you the right cards such that that completely random meaning is what the person needs to hear. So I think having a trust in spirit is really important as well. And it does require a bit of like surrendering of the ego, I guess, like, Yes, you're a good reader, but it's also that spirit is very intelligent and will show you the right cards so that you deliver the right message, which is another thing I think to reassure you is that like for new tarot readers, um, trust that whoever is receiving your reading, whether it's like someone in person or many people watching a video, spirit wouldn't have brought them there if 
there wasn't something for them to gain from your message. So the fact that they're there, it already means you have something important for them. And you know, whether that's like just one nugget in the reading or the whole thing, that's not really your business. Like you're just there to provide that service of confirmation. Sometimes I'll even get comments of like, oh wow, the first half of the reading was great, but then like I hated the second half. And I'm like, okay, maybe you were just meant to hear the first half. It's not about being right all the time for everybody. It's really about the service of giving someone that confirmation or giving someone that reassurance. I will even tell you something. One time, 2021, I wanna say, I gave someone a personal reading and they said nothing resonated. <laughs> By knowing that that message wasn't for them, then they knew what was for them. Like it works in weird ways like that. It's not just about um, validating our ego of you read the cards well. Like we don't know how that person is meant to be served. We don't know the, the message that they're meant to hear and that's not really our business, you know? So just remember it's about the other person. Oh, I really like this one. Why like this keeps happening that a big manifestation is all over the cards and I also feel it coming. It got cut off, but I'm assuming that they, they said like, it's all over the cards and they feel it coming, but then it doesn't happen. Have I been here? I think we've all been there. What I can say is that manifestations come from the 5D, I'll call it the 5D, from the spirit realm, from the non-physical realm. And we have to understand that time doesn't really exist there. I would also get these confusing things of like, it's happening soon, it's happening soon, and then it's been years. But I think we have to understand that in, in the spirit realm, in the non-physical realm, it's already happened. And that that really is the key to manifesting is understanding that it's already happened and giving yourself permission to feel that joy right now without shame without um like i've really been feeling this way recently when i give myself permission to be happy about something that hasn't happened yet um i don't feel like i'm faking it doesn't it doesn't feel like acting as if it doesn't feel like i'm being silly it doesn't feel like i'm pretending it just feels like i understand how manifestation works like i i know that it's already happened so it's just you know when you see those messages over and over again i think rather than getting in that mindset of like oh but it's been saying this forever and it hasn't happened yet which i get that but now i feel like i just give myself permission to be happy and not feel ashamed about it and not feel silly about it because I, I just know, I know that it's already done because actually that non-physical realm is real life, you know? And what's right in front of me right now is an illusion. Highly recommend narrow knowledge. That's a great manifestation YouTube channel. It's yours. It is already yours. Any astrological changes happening, we should be aware of. Yes. Like I was talking about the institutions of power that are being dismantled. My brother Pluto is going to go into Aquarius. Pluto is direct now, but it's probably still in Capricorn. And then it's going to go into Aquarius on November 19th, very soon. So Pluto represents power, but also represents destruction and upheaval and like groundbreaking change. And so it's been in Capricorn for so long, which Capricorn is like, you know, the top dogs, the CEOs, the men in suits, <laughs> capitalism. So that's where the power has been. The power has been in corporations. The power has been in the select few at the top. It's gonna move into Aquarius. Pluto's moving into Aquarius. Aquarius is about the people, the collective, liberty, equality for everybody. Like Aquarius has that kind of vibe, progressive, innovative humanitarian so it really feels to me like power going back to the people i've heard some people say that the french revolution and another revolution i can't remember happened when pluto was in aquarius and also this is pretty big so you know the outer planets saturn uranus neptune pluto they have all been in earth and water signs for a very long time and for the first time in ages, they are all going to be in fire and air signs. I don't know how many, how many years it's been, probably like hundreds of years. Saturn is gonna move into Aries, fire sign. Uranus is gonna move into 
Gemini, <laughs> air sign. Neptune is going to move into Aries, fire sign. Pluto is going to move into Aquarius, air sign. What I have heard some astrologers say is that humans are going to start evolving really quickly, especially our brains. We're going to start to be able to access more of our brains, which could look like us tapping into psychic abilities or abilities that we didn't know we previously had. And there could also be great advancements in technology and things like that. Would you consider doing a meet and greet with your followers? I would like to do that, but I don't know where the heck in the world <laughs> that should be done. I haven't really eaten much of this stuff because I've just been so busy yapping. Let me try. Black Thunder is my favorite. So usually it's just like plain chocolate and then there's this like crunchy cookie inside. See, this, this is what I'm talking about. The crunchy cookie on the inside? Are you kidding me? This, this is the best. This is the perfect balance of potato and chocolate. They understood the assignment. I should have paced this better, but it's okay. <laughs> Apple pie Kit Kat. This is what she looks like. Oh, that smells like a candle. That smells like an apple candle. It's cinnamony. It tastes like Christmas. I just want to show you what the panda looks like. Because they're so cute. They have like different facial expressions. This one has a queasy looking face. This one's laughing. He's going Mmm. <coughs> this is like caramel corn. Or like caramelly. I guess that's the the brulee part of it. I do not get potato, but she doesn't need potato. The brulee shines on her own. Very good, very nice. We like the Suck suck panda. Okay, so the last, yeah, the last question. Do you have any recommendations for books or movies? I am not that much of a book person, but I did read the books Journey of Souls and Destiny of Souls, which I would recommend to any spiritual person. It's accounts of a doctor hypnotizing his patients and they are recalling experiences of their past lives and the space where they go to in between their incarnations, that non-physical space. They map out what that world looks like, what souls look like, the different types of souls, um, how soul groups are formed and the lessons they learn together. And there's a lot of consistencies throughout the different people, which I think is really interesting. When I do read, I tend to read more nonfiction books. So for example, I've read The Body Keeps the Score, which was really interesting. I'm reading Change Your Brain Every Day right now, which is about brain health. And actually that's the book that inspired me to finally, I mean, <laughs> I just ate a bunch of sugar, but <laughs> that's the book that finally inspired me to like, start cutting it out and taking charge of your fertility. I guess these are all like health books, but that was hands down my favorite. I never know if it's like TMI to talk about this kind of thing, but I went off the pill, I did not like it. And I started to chart my cycle naturally. And it's just been so empowering. And I've learned so much about my body because I added a lot of extra rows in the chart to take notes. So I take notes about like when I'm feeling creative, when I had a very uh, vivid dream, what my mood is like, how, my, how I'm performing when I exercise. I have like varicose veins and they flare up sometimes. So I track that too. And it's so interesting to see certain things will happen and I can like predict it to the day. I'm like, oh, my leg's gonna start hurting tomorrow. I'm gonna be really tired. I'm not gonna be able to do anything tomorrow. Or like, oh, my mood's gonna be good this week. It's just, it's really, really nice to be in touch with your body like that. So for anyone who has a cycle, highly recommend that book. Movies, okay. My favorite movie is Arrival. It has everything I like. Aliens, linguistics, and trippy concepts about the way the universe works. I don't want to give it away in case you haven't seen it, but I highly recommend you watch it. Basically, some aliens come to Earth. Nobody knows what the fuck they're saying. And there's, there's many of them who landed in different countries. And so each part of the world, they get like their top person to try to figure it out. And so we are following Louise, who is 
a, like a professor of linguistics. And so she has the task of going to talk to these aliens and figure out why they're here and what they're trying to tell us. And eventually she does. And I think what they were saying is true and not just for the movie. And I think it's a, it's very, it's a very interesting concept and it has some like ethical dilemmas in it. And it, it's just, it's very interesting about like the universe, about the human condition. And of course, like I like languages and I like aliens. So it was very fun for me to watch. And also Coco, Mama Coco, that movie. Oh! That makes me cry. Um, and there's a movie called Cherry Blossoms, which is a German movie that takes place in Germany in the first half, Japan in the second half. Oh my God, it's such a, um, like a tearjerker. It's like a drama, romance, that kind of thing. I don't wanna give anything away, but if you can watch it, I really, really recommend that movie. It's just like, if you wanna like, ooh, if you wanna cry and like, ooh, <laughs> then you should watch Cherry Blossoms. Okay. Finally, I'm gonna eat a gummy and then I think that's everything. So that, oh my gosh, I was just, I just got hit with a apple. That's potent. So this is what they look like, little fettuccines. Mm-hmm, mm. It's a bit sour, just like a tart apple. That's so good. I think my favorite thing Mmm, Luigi. <laughs> this was my favorite, but out of the sweets, I like the chestnut choco pie, I like the black thunder, I like the Kit Kat, but the, the top two, it's the chestnut choco pie and the black thunder. These were good, like, these were good, but not like, oh my gosh, you know, they're like just normal good, and then this was like, eh. Luigi tore it up. Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much for watching. Happy Halloween. It was a pleasure to hang out with you. I would have had Yumi with us, but she she cannot behave herself around food. I hope you have a wonderful day or night whenever you're watching. And I wish you all the best. Please take good care of yourself. Stay healthy. And I will see you guys in the next, in the next one. Bye-bye.